Yeah. 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 No, I, I gotta change out my shot, man. Reels. Yeah. You want a shot, man, cameraman? Oh, I got one. You got one? Yeah, thank you. Let me know if you need another one. I got you. You know what I'm saying? Rascal up, dog. We share. Can't get too fucked up. One love from Reels. One rascal. There's another rascal, you know what I mean? We got the T, R, G. We connect the show, you know, brotherly love. We never disconnect. I got the half, you got the other half. It's a brotherhood. Rascal gang. I met Lazy when I was what, 16, 15, around there. He was just like the older head in the back, in the shadow. He wants you to do right things, you know? He wants you to come up, you know? If you know Lazy, you know the saying, we are more than G's. When I got to know him, you know, he told me, if you have dreams and ambitions, go for it. Everything I heard about this nigga, it's just all been a whole bunch of big shit about how he changed a whole lot of people's lives. He's an inspiration in the hood. He, he, he's done it all, you know what I mean? Everybody looks up to him. He had a big impact on the hood. He shaped the whole hood as I see it. Some people have heroes like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, but my, my role model, my hero is lazy, you know? So I had met Vanna, also known to the streets as Lazy, when I was doing research for my first film about Asian gangs. In the end, he actually played a part in my film. And uh, through working with him on that project, a really great friendship developed. And as I got to know him more, I was really drawn to his story and moved by the experiences that he had gone through. So here we are a year later, and we're doing a documentary together based on his life. So sit back and get ready for a true story. Vanna was born on April 20th, 1979 in Cambodia. Him and his family fled the killing fields during the last year of the Khmer Rouge regime as war was breaking out with Vietnam. When they got to America, the family settled in Pomona, California. We lived in Holloway, uh, 1500 block in Holloway in Pomona. The neighborhood was a lot of Asian, Southeast Asians, Vietnamese, Laos, Cambodians. So growing up in my neighborhood, Everybody knew everybody from a childhood. We became all family. For Cambodia, this was like almost, I guess, the project, you could say. Basically, it was the project. This is the H section right here. We lived in one crappy apartment with broken windows. We were sharing food, family to family. Now it's a lot better. It looks way better. Now they got fucking gates and shit on, on the windows and stuff like that. First day of school, everybody had a couple new gear. My brother got a new pair of pants, I got a new pair of shirt. The next day, we switched that. Despite being poor, Vanna and his neighborhood friends found ways to have fun. Nothing bored us during our childhood. We wanted to play war, we dig a big hole in the back, and we made water balls with sand and just threw it at each other. Then when skateboarding was in, we all wanted to be skaters. We used to ride to our middle schools, our elementary schools in a group. We did everything together in that group of kids that we grew up with. That motherfucker used to thought he was a badass in skateboarding and shit, trying to ollie, he had ramps and everything right here through this, this block. There used to be no grass here. All this shit looked different. It used to be brown. I'm talking about dirt brown, not, not like this shit right here. Didn't have that, all that rails and all that shit. Well, so this is his house right here. This is exactly where he, where he lived at, coming from the front view. Back then he was like so young, was like probably eight years old. He's always hanging around with me and my little brother. He's always been a troublemaker around Hollywood. He's always out there running, chasing the other kids, fighting, arguing with other kids. So one time he got beat up, something like that. And then I went up to him and say, do you want to beat him up? I'll show you how, just come with me. I'll teach you how to fight and all that stuff. He was just prepping me up, pumping me up, motivating me up like he was my trainer. He just threw me. In the middle, it was fist fight. There was no boxing glove. We fought, fought, fought. So I show him how to move a little, like boxing and all that stuff. And then I tell him, go back and kick the ass. So he did. He looked up to me. I said, he got scared because I told him, if he don't beat him up, I'm going to kick his ass. So he said, all right, I'm going to go kick the ass. So he tried all his best, and he beat him up. 
And then the next day I take him again to fight all the kids around there. And one time he lost, so I pulled him out and beat his ass down with my brother. And he cries and I say, look, you better win. There's only one way to win. You gotta be strong. You gotta keep on fighting, fighting. Don't ever give up. <laughs> The dance scene got really popular in Pomona around this time. An explosive new wave of b-boys emerged. I got into dancing with the rest of the fellas right when we hit the sixth grade. I didn't have a curfew, so I practiced all night. The picture got bigger because school dances was a time for you to prepare what moves you have. Are you ready for a battle? One day at a school dance, Vanna saw an aerial backflip performed by someone from another crew. He was immediately inspired by it. And when I seen that, I went to talk to one of my old school buddies from Holloway, Simo. We started practicing that routine. When we figured that out, we went and showed it off to our friends in the neighborhood. And people was like, whoa. That became one of my moves that I used it as a signature. I used to peek through my living room window. I used to see like six, seven of them on my neighborhood in Holloway. They was out there blowing up their music through speakers, hanging out when I was probably eight. They was probably in their 15, 16. Across the street from me was an OG, OG Playboy. Up the street from me was OG Chuko. Down the street was Kim Say. There was a lot of uh, people that I looked at as um, uncles, because they all knew my father. They came in my house. I was, wasn't too interested at first. I really loved my dance, like what I was doing, but came down to a point where I, I used to peek in the middle of the night through my window and just like, what are these guys doing? I never knew how gangs looked like. I thought there was the guys who wear the motorcycle jackets with like spikes sticking out. I start seeing the group that I was hanging out. They was talking about TRGs. <laughs> 3D. <laughs> C-Tac Rascal. C-Tac. <clears throat> Rascal. I said, hey, baby, Seattle, Tacoma, 7126, 216, 253. Seattle to Tacoma all day. Five deep, 10 deep, 20 deep, no matter what, still represented, no matter what, it's getting shit. My dad, he likes to go off and drink with his buddies. He was walking home. My mom went driving around looking for him, so he won't have to walk. We was driving. Our brother screamed, there goes dad. Look, look. We seen two cars parked with a bunch of guys jumping him, beating him up for his necklace. Police came, tried to ask for what happened and all this stuff. My dad was beat down, he was drunk. My mom was trying to explain to them what happened. Her English was broken, so it was hard to testify anything. No justice was put in. The TRG fellas, the older ones, they came by to see how he was doing, and they stood up for my dad. During this time in Pomona, there were an increasing amount of racial hate crimes aimed towards blacks and Asians from Mexican gangs who felt threatened by the influx of non-Hispanics moving into their communities. This one uh, black guy used to come around our neighborhood. We didn't know his name or nothing, but he came around a lot. And all the Asian kids used to gather up around him because he used to do backflip over cars, he used to do tricks for us, and we used to go watch him. Everybody was just cheering him on. It was powerful. I seen two gangsters riding a bike through the neighborhood started cussing him out as the bike was rolling through. Fuck you, motherfuckers! What's up? What's up, huh? What you trying to do, huh? The bikes rolled off. We seen the car skirted out right away. And then we heard um, him screaming for help. Help! At that time, I was young. I don't know what the neighborhood did, but me, I froze. One day while walking home, 
Bannon witnessed something that sparked his interest in TRG. When I was leaving elementary school, I seen one of the older TRG guys, Flavor. He fought a total one-on-one. -on -one. Both of their faces were bleeding. There was no Asian guys surrounding watch. He fought. When I seen that, I was actually scared. I can't back him up. I can't do nothing. We were scared of any cholos out there, gang members. They made fun of us being bullied. We got used to just walking straight. Seeing how Playboy fought back against the Mexican gangs, it inspired him to stand up for himself. Bannon began to look up to Playboy and the TRGs as his role models. Being inside my house, it was hard for me to look at my father as a role model. Because when I come home, he's busy being angry. He's with his friends, they're drinking. He's busy angry at my mom. Bannon's life at home was far from perfect, oftentimes becoming a witness and victim of domestic violence stemming from his father's struggle with alcohol and drug addiction. I didn't want to join a gang, because I thought gangs were scary, leather jackets, spiky things. When I wanted to join TRG, I thought it was just joining a fight. The stories I heard, the fight they put, I wanted to be that. They protected my father, and if I become a TRG, maybe I could protect your father. Lazy's always look up to me like my big brother, because he's been hanging around with us since a little kid, probably like around eight years old. He was like, you know, Elementary, I was in a junior high. I take him along with me everywhere we go. We like ride skateboarding, break dancing. At one time, I was pitching on a skateboard, he fell on his ass. He cried. He went to his dad. His dad chased me with, almost chased me with a shotgun. So I ran all over the place in Hollywood. He got a crazy as dad. My very personal OG. Um, was getting jumped in. Goofy had been like an older brother to Vanna when growing up. When Goofy was jumped into TRG, it was only natural for Vanna to follow suit. Well, I stood there, just in a line, just like boot camp style. Three guys, they stood there in the middle of a field, a baseball field. Chuko, Playboy, and Gangster. That's gonna jump our little group in to be the first generation in Pomona. When they jumped me in and initiated me, I was official. When I joined TRG, I was like, I was, I was a young bug, man. I was a, I was just a little dude, 16, 17. Being around them, just lazy, other older homies, you know, show me that love. I was just a little nigga looking for some direction. I was going through some hard times. We lost our house because of drugs. Me and, my brother, me and my brother was homeless. At a young age, you see your friends pass away and this and that, and the only people I could really uh, to relate to was my homeboys because my family was never there for me. Growing up, we saw a lot of shit together. We've been through a whole bunch of stuff that no nobody else that I ever met when I grew up that would be there because sometimes it's too real for other people. You know? And then that's when I started kicking it with their, his older brother, and then we started going around the hood. We was chilling with my rascals, just having a good time, maybe barbecuing and shit. Lazy was the main reason I joined. Yeah, yeah, he gave me advice and this and that in life. And then, you know, like, this, this is what I am, TRG, rascal. They're there for me January through December, fucking Monday through Sunday, seven days a week, 12 to 12, on dot, you know what I mean? On call, wherever, you know what I mean? And I'm grateful to, to have people that, you know, that are there for me. Soon enough, they asked me if I was down for them for life. You know, it's a big question because, you know, it's just people that you meet, but then they ask you that question because if you have that connection with them in, those short, in that short time you're with them, then, you know, then that's, that's when you become a rascal, you know? I just got love for these niggas. That's why I'm in the game. When school began again, OG Playboy would come and pick Vanna up to make sure no one messed with the newest and youngest member of the family. He was in Black Regal with Gangster Drive. I was like, damn. Playboy just came and he just had like this Raiders hat just looking on. He just looked at me, he just get in the car and he just gave me a ride home. And there was trolls everywhere. And he was just staring at every gangster out there. He was just giving them what you want to do look. Don't look back at that time because he was taking everything ready to the game. This is when Gang bang. 
it's about to get started. And I'm in the passenger side. I start learning the game later by later and start seeing guns here and here. As racial tensions began to rise in Pomona, Vanna quickly began to see the realities of gang violence. There was a young TRG named Dartman who had a crush on Vanna's sister. He would often come over to the house to hang out with her. One day, Dartman and another TRG were walking to Vanna's house when they were suddenly attacked. Pulled the trigger. Shot Dartman. That's a shotgun. It's a powerful weapon. The other guy ran. This is a lot of new shocking things to the young TRGs. That's the beginning of knowing that things are serious business. There are gang wars and there are hate crimes out there. That's when I had to see a bigger picture. And I seen it painted by blood. This is where we're active as hell, too. Yeah. I mean, like, how often was there, like, a shooting? Shit. Every, probably every other day, probably every week. You know? We just always get into it with them. Because it was a racial war. It wasn't really a gang war no more. Because we used to actually, because they still, <coughs> It was because um, they were trying to take us out of uh, the whole, you know, city and shit, trying to get us out. So basically, it was wasn't even a it wasn't even a TRG against uh, Pomona 12th Street no more. It's like turned racial. The motherfuckers started, you know, trying to shoot at regular, you know, Cambodians, any Asians. Yeah, All right, let me take you through that park. Uh, can't stop at that park though. This this is 12th Street's park too. Yeah, there's still beef, but it's not that mu it's not that bad. I mean, they don't, you know, we're not even out here gangbanging, really. I mean, everybody's trying to get their money, but I mean, as long as we don't step on nobody's toes, you know, we're fine. As long as they don't step on our toes, we'll be fine. That's the 7-Eleven we used to go play Street Fighter at a long time ago. Uh, be out there skipping school, go play Street Fighter. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. We decided, let's get out and go play. Street Fighter, 7-Eleven. Walked out the door, seen a black car. I know that black car. They came out. Pulled out a gun. I knew that was a sign of problem. There was a problem with my family. My dad, he was heavily into drinking and gambling. During this time, as TRGs began to fight back against the Mexican gangs, the older Cambodians running the gambling houses started to recognize them. They start knowing those are the bad boys on the streets now. They're now been offered money to handle business for them. I went inside and I told my dad, of who's here? They're holding a gun. My mom and dad start locking all the doors. And I left because I still wanted to go play games, so I left. And when I came home, I found out stories from my mom it happened that they came looking for your dad. And your dad was upstairs holding his gun, telling him to leave. And my mom said that she was telling, begging him to leave, just leave. But they was trying to unlock the door from the bottom floor. So I don't know what happened after that, but the crazy part is I just joined TRG. And when I came out, now the ones that's after my dad is TRGs. The next day, Vanna went to school not knowing that when he came home, his life in Pomona was coming to an abrupt end. I noticed a truck from Washington State and TVs going to my neighbors, parents' car being given away, none of my clothes was packed, just the family. They was waiting for me to get home. Throwing in the car, we're moving. I started crying, where are we going? We're going to Seattle. I started crying in the car because I missed all my friends right away. I just made an accomplishment of joining a breakdancing crew. And now we're moving. I just looked out the window on the whole ride. It was like a 24-hour drive. I just looked out the window the whole way. Vanna moved to Rainier, an area of Seattle that was heavily gang-affiliated. There were Bloods and Crips, but no TRG. There he was enrolled into South Shore Middle School. Dancing didn't start out here. So I didn't have nothing to look forward to. I went to class, people was ignoring me. Even my teachers was ignoring me. They put me in the back of the class. 
where everybody's desk was facing towards the teacher, my desk was facing towards this wall. I couldn't really hear what the teacher's trying to teach me. Later, Vanna went to complain to his teacher about his difficulties in class, only to receive a bitter response. So I told her, and she go, you thought you had a bat? Wait till tomorrow. Vanna went to school the next day, but when it came time for that class, he would skip it for fear of what punishment his teacher had waiting for him. It would be the last time he attended school. I left school one day after school, I was walking, and there was this one guy, he was walking towards me, he kept looking, but there was one of my classmates that he was walking with. We walked past each other, we looked at each other's eyes, we're like, what's up, what's up? I'm walking home. He turns around, he goes, hey, what gang are you from? I turn around, I'm like, I'm from TRG. Then he showed me his tattoo, he just went, Pfft. and he had TRG right here. I was so happy. I jumped up, I'm like, oh, what's up? Then he goes, my brother just got jumped in too. So now there's three of us. They all dropped out of school. And I had a reason why I don't want to go to school now starting this way. So when it was all drop out, I met up with them early in the morning. When, when the parents went to work, that's where we all kicked it. Kicked it. In the early 90s, along with the popular influence of gangster rap music, a new wave of youth gangs began to appear all across the country. Gangs really started out here in Seattle. Like the 90s, it started hard out here. The gangs that was here in Seattle in the 90s, it was starting to get made, made up. Like four guys sat together and be like, hey, let's make up this gang, and all their friends joined. But when TRG came in, it was already history. So when you hear that as one of the first Asian gangs to step up to the plate and fought against the racist enemies. So when they joined TRG, it was the new thing in town. It was the new thing with the rascal. Probably that one of the first ones joined TRG, he was third leader of the Wild Tees. Um, it was a Crip gang. But his brother, that time, was one of them that made up the SAG gang at that time. So when he joined, a lot started coming. When the main guys got in, the other followers were like, why the fuck not? So everybody was gray ragging throughout the whole Rainier Avenue. When we was all still young, just learning the whole system. I'm new to it again. I remember joining when I was in Pomona, but I did not experience gang life until I reached it here in Seattle. This is where it all happens. The gangland over here is very different from where I, I just came from. Where I come from, it's like everybody grew up together, so we made our choices to join TRG. When I came to this city, there's so much gangs. There's like 20, 30 different gangs, all Crips and Blood. People was switching gangs, like, it's okay. I've known guys who joined seven different gangs. When you do that, you bring your new gang into a war. It was hard to just trust anybody. It wasn't, wasn't the way that we wanted to start out as. An instant where this guy named Chris K, he was from a gang called UTB, Uptown Boys. It's a blood gang. Looney, Popcorn's brother, didn't want him in. But I was like, everybody's getting in our hood, man. Let's just get deeper. So when Chris K joined another gang, Young Seattle Blood, we did not know. Went to the pool hall. We see Chris K walked in with his new gang, all red. It was just three of us, and there were like seven, eight of them. Looney dropped his pool stick and said, let's go outside, you're getting jumped out. Right when we went outside, Chris Carey's new gang, each pulled out a gun on us. We only had one, and we took our time pulling it out. We had to take it out of the bottom seat of the back car, we had some screws. These guys are pointing guns at us, I'm like, damn, they can shoot us any time. But Looney was down, he was, he was taking charge. He was like one of the guys that you could learn from. He was leader mentality, he had it in him. And he was proud to learn a lot from him. He pulled out the thing, threw it towards me, like, point this back at them, I'm gonna beat this motherfucker's ass in front of all these guns. He did. He ran up to Chris K, start fighting. He said, you're getting jumped out. But the heart that Looney had is amazing. He fought this guy one-on-one -on -one until he was jumped out personally. That time, we was new. We was like the first five people. So he was making us look like champions, like you don't betray us. 
because we'll kick your ass in front of the seven guns. We, we don't just go around jumping people in. Nah, we, we ain't like that, bro. We, we gotta get to know you, you feel me? It's hard you gotta, to get, you gotta, you gotta yeah. let me know you're down. It's hard to get in our hood, man. Yeah. It's hard it's to get easy, in our hood, it's man. E it's, like take an app. it's like take an app, you get interviewed, you fail, you're gone, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We do that background check, where you from? You know what I'm saying? The homies you know and shit, man. All that shit, dog. Childhood, all that damn. Yep. We need all that info. 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 Security, nigga, all that everything, dog. If you want welfare, homie, we know all that. We know all that. Y'all child support with three baby mamas, you know what I'm talking about, nigga. You know what I'm saying? We don't. That's fucked up. See, that's the thing, man. It's not about numbers, it's about strength. My brother, he used to bring a lot of his friends to the house, to my parents' apartment. And he's just bringing stolen stuff from stealing cars late at night. So we got kicked out of the apartment. So my mom and dad, when we got kicked out of the apartment, we, they went, they found some older friends that they could, you know, pay to stay in a room. And I couldn't live there because it was in my enemy neighborhood in Tacoma. Uh, what happened was I went to the streets and I didn't want nobody to know. All I knew that existed here in Seattle was gangs until like a late 1993. Rumors went out that there was a breakdancing competition at Mercer Middle School. And it was at the gym, a whole city of uh, Bremerton, Washington. They came down. There was some badass dancers. I didn't think dancing exists because I've been looking for dancers this whole time. Here's the day. I'm watching. I'm hearing the music. I'm getting hyped. And then Looney and them knew that I know how to do certain moves. So today, they kept encouraging me, go, go. I'm like, no, nah, I'm shy, I'm shy. These guys are in their Adidas, just ready to go. I'm in my Nike Cortez, Dickies. I go out there. I just I sat down in a group of Seattle guys that I don't know. I dance, and you can hear it on a video, Looney's like, Rasco, Rasco, and my move didn't fade, nothing. But I just had that little dancing in me to go out there and do it. The guys that were right beside me was t talking to me. They were like, hey, what's up? You should come by and practice with us. We practice at Jefferson Community Center. At first, I was like, nah, but it was really hyping. I can't refuse something that just was just fun. Later that Friday, Banna would go and practice with the dancers he had met at the competition. A short while later, he would become a part of that crew. The day when it got serious, when I walked in Jefferson, I wanted to be a, a boss crew member, which was the crew that I was dancing with in that moment. We already knew that we wanted him. He was coming around, and it seemed like he wanted it, and he could, you know, he could teach us a couple things, and you know, it, it was it was kind of natural. That crew right there was the best crew in not just Seattle, Washington. I was a team leader at, at a rec center, and uh, he used to come up there and break, and he would come up there and dance with a bunch of other kids, and he was really good, like super powerful. He was one of those cats that he would see somebody do something, and then he'd be doing it better than you did it, and you're like, man, this guy out of here with that. <laughs> when I first met Lazy, you can tell he had some hood in him. Like, you can tell that, you know, he's rough around the edges. So it's like, he was making the change to where it's like, you're either going to go one way or another. In 1995, Banna and his boss crew would take part in a huge competition at the Seattle Center. Like 30 crews, hundreds of people surround me coming into the show. Judges was old schools. DJs was packed, the lights was bright, it was the moment. So we battled, we battled over and over, we battled against every crew, our toughest crew battle zone. They was giving it to us, we was giving it back. Other crews did not want to step out. My crew member Raymond seen me did this high flare and he motivated me to do a flare 90. That became my signature move, flare 90. I busted, like I reached a flare so high where I just 90 and spin told me to save that move for one of the last moments. But in the beginning, I did this poppy move, like just bounce, boom. And the other side, they shake their head, they were mad at me. People was calling out, won't you guys go out? Hey, 
Valentine's late night and Valentine's Barber Show Washington State Breakdance Champions. <laughs> Boss! Something happened to me when the judge mentioned that we won first place. That was the biggest prize that I had as a group, not individual, I had it as a group. And I had a moment of being like somebody coming up to me and say, hey, congratulations. I don't think nobody else ever congratulated me for anything because I dropped out seventh grade. Everybody believed in me. Everybody believed in each other. So we kept on dancing. So that dance never stopped. And when I did left that day, I peeked out through the door. Oh boy, it was like all kind of enemies waiting for me. Lazy stood out is because a lot of these, a lot of the other kids didn't have the same background. Like they might have, you know, dibbled and dabbled here and there, but they weren't. They ain't putting no work, at least not to the same level as Lazy did. I met Lazy back in uh, back in like '95. You know what I mean? Uh, he was kind of like a like a star out here. There's people who might be in a gang, and all they do is love their people. Like you know, what I'm saying they might be in a gang or from the streets, but they have a, a golden heart. You know what I'm saying? They're not out there trying to kill people or trying to hurt people or sell dope or any of that stuff. They just want to uplift their people and make sure everything is good. And there's other people who are the opposite. They're rotten apples. They're bad. Every battle, you, you know, it was exciting to see him. You know what I mean? Like, you go to a jam, you knew that Boss Crew was going to be in the house and he was going to be killing it on the floor. I started um, to have more faith in myself, like in dancing. I started to feel confident. I was practicing on grass outside, cement. The clothes I was wearing is the closest that you're gonna see me dancing. At that time, I was still knocking at uh, my friend's house in the middle of the night, be like, hey, could you give me your brother's key? Unlock your brother's car door. I slept in there in the middle of the night. In the morning, I go, when my, uh, the homie's parents go to work, I went and go, I got some more rest there, and I practice where I can. He brought a different, like, train of thought to the whole b-boy thing because, you know, not only was he leaving behind something else and making a turn for another direction, but the traits that he learned from the street, like loyalty and dedication, like he brought that to the game as well. When I used to lay down, I had so much to think about, about life. Instead of stressing, stressing myself away, I took the last moment to stress what moves should I do. I got a competition coming up. One day, Vanna went to a competition by himself, competing against 13 different crews. He entered as a single-man crew, representing Boss. I battle against everybody. You know, every round, they, every crew come out one at a time, or somebody just come out, fade you, fade you. But there's not just one round. It could go up to five rounds. I went through four. Four rounds in this battle. That's a single-man crew. The crazy part is, I battled each and every one of them. And every crew had like 13 to 30 people in their crew. I battled everybody. Beat everybody. I had a lot of anger in me that made me want to dance and I used my anger in the battlefields of a dance floor. He was there when Massive first started. I think uh, the first battle that we ever did together was, uh, it was a battle in, uh, I believe it was in Olympia. It was the first time that uh, like a lot of this old school cast came together. I was part of it, Big Lazy was part of it. It was called Massive, it was a long time ago. Uh, so he, he's actually been there since the beginning of Massive. And then when we merged into Massive Monkeys, you know, automatically, you know, he's, he's part of the Massive Monkey family. He was always, um, he always had our back too. He would never let anybody touch our crew or, or anything like that, you know? So, um, you know, maybe he inspired me in a way that I'm, that, you know, it kind of taught us to look out for each other. My experience with him, it made me who I am today, you know. Taught me how to be humble, you know, taught me how to be a really good b-boy. Uh, he's, to me, he's, you know, he's my inspiration. Battling your own imagination. Because that's the only way you can defeat who, who you're battling against is by being creative. That's what people give props for. Props for who practice hard, who puts in work, who challenges another person's creative mind. The crazy thing is how I used to look at everybody that wasn't a TRG was my enemy. 
the next guy you jump could have been that guy that you're dancing with. Could have been your friend, it could have been your homie. B-boy, dance, break dance. It changed my life and it saved my life. All right, let's kill the music, kill the music, kill the music, kill the music. So check it out. I just want to give some love to my boy Lazy. Not only is he an inspiration for Master Monkey's crew, original boss member, he's our family. This is one of the pioneers in the Seattle b-boy scene during our generation, and it also happens to be his birthday. So make some more time now. Let's give him a birthday shout out on three. One, two, three. Happy birthday. You know, B-Boy Slam 3, like everybody else. But another one was this three-day breakboard battle here in Seattle. And Lazy, man, I must have worn out my VHS in one of your movies, man. I'm not gonna front. This is one of my biggest inspirations right here. So one more time, make some noise for Lazy, y'all. Thank, Thank you, brother. There's this guy um, that I grew up in Pomona. His name is Gangster, Sai. I looked at him as an uncle, I, to the point where he knows my family, my parents gave him a place to stay when he came over here. I stayed with him, I introduced him to all my homies, but he took power too hard. My girlfriend was dropping me off to kick back with my homies in the hood. I walked up, all the homies like, what's up, lady, what's up? Shaking hands with everybody, and the last hand was his. I was looking down at his palm. Get ready to shake, he had a Buddha necklace around his fist with the head part that was sharp. Right when I stuck out my hand, it disappeared on me before my eyes. Next thing you know, when I looked up, boom, boom. I was getting socks. I cut my lip right here, it just cut me open. I was bleeding, then my hat fell. He told me, pick up your hat. I bowed down a little, pick up my hat, gave me a good knee to my face where I just flopped back. And that time, I was 15, 15 years old, he was 25 years old. When he beat me, he came up to me and he said, that's what you get for being a break dancer, you pretty boy. You want to kick back with pretty boys, huh? You want to be a pretty boy, huh? And then my homies in the hood, Stimpy and Pony, they picked me up, they brought me to the restroom. They're cleaning me up. You all right, Lazy? They're washing my face. Yeah, you all right, man? My homie said, get in the car. Yeah, get him washed up. We're going to get him for you. They said, we're going to get him for you. He's going to get shot. Gonna get this we're going to shoot him. I said, no, don't do it. It's been done. Don't worry about it. You know, because a lot of people would take this opportunity to just get revenge. Me, it's been done, and I'm not going to put nobody's life on their line. For doing something for me, you should feel special that you have a friend that wants to go through drash and measure for you, that wants to get somebody for you. Just be appreciated that you have somebody like that, but don't let him. Because if he cares about you, you got to care about him, too. Because if you don't, he'll be the one doing time in jail. And after that, Who's the bad friend? So I said no. And then he comes, came banging the door, opens the door, came in aggressive. What the fuck are you guys talking about? My road dog stepped out, I was like, nothing. He walked out, he came in, he's like, lazy. You know you're like my nephew, right? I just shook my head, yeah. I'm supposed to be your uncle. I'm like, yeah. I didn't mean to do that, I just hit you because so many enemies out there and you're out here break dancing, doing all this stupid shit. You know, I don't want you to get caught slipping like that. A real uncle, a real person that's trying to watch your back would have encouraged you to do something better with your life. Somebody that I thought I was a role model from TRG that I always looked up to, that I bragged about. The reason why I got in these reasons of today turned his back on me and embarrassed me. His mission was to humiliate me, to degrade me, to lower down my self-esteem in life. Another incident two weeks later would ultimately cause Banna to quit dancing. We used to practice at a garage, somebody's house. And that's why I used to go practice when late nights closed down community centers, 
I got approached by one of the dancers and said, hey, you know what's going on? I said, what's going on? Christian's spreading rumors about you that you stole his dad's credit card and went and got gang-affiliated tattoos. I said, what the fuck? He said, I stole his credit card. So I gave him a phone call. Did you blame on me for stealing some credit card? He said, yeah. The FBI got you on videotape. I'm gonna take you down. We, you stole my dad's credit card and went and got tattooed. I go, tell the FBI to come arrest me. I'm 16 years old. How the hell am I gonna use a credit card to get a tattoo? And he's like, oh, we got you. We're gonna get you. And the crazy thing is, one official, I don't even know how to use a credit card. I never had one in my life. My mom taught me not to steal. It's been years now, and there's still no single proof. I just got a bad name for nothing. So that kind of built me from having both sides turn on me at one time. I got beat down, humiliated for being a break dancer. When I was supposed to rely on dancing, they turned on me and looked at me as I'm a gangster, that I'm the only one that can stole this credit card. We're not gonna let the whole world think that we're, just because we wear a gray flag, just because we represent TRG, just because we represent a gang, that we're bad people, because people's gonna look at us different. We, we always said that, man, I'm sick and tired of somebody judging me. When I used to be a break dancer, people still look at me as a gang member. It, it, they never let you give up, and when you finally give up, when you finally let things go, they will continue to judge you, and they will continue to spark to bring you back out. Like, when you guys first joined in, I always stood up for you guys. I always said, man, leave these, leave these guys alone, let them. And, That's the truth, too. And when you guys, you guys ain't never had a big homie that could show you guys the opposite of making you guys be the hardest guy on the street. But me, I told you guys, make me proud, finish school, right? Finish school. You, you basically said, do, do, do what makes you, you know, uh, live your life and all that, you know? So I can stop. Get a job, graduate. And I remember every, whoever graduated, you came to the graduation and was like, yep, I'm proud of you, you know what I mean? And then that's what really mattered in life, because you do, get a good job, get a family, take care of your family, you know? That's all it is, man. Yep. Just, because, just because you're in the gang don't mean you're a bad person. Yep. You feel me? It's the choices that you make. Yep. The decisions you make after you join the gang, that's what makes you the person you really are. Yeah. Everybody yeah. learns, everybody yeah. learns. Even I had to learn, G. Yep. <laughs> One afternoon, while hanging out at his girlfriend's house, Bannon received an urgent call. Pick up phone law. She's like, hey, get to Tacoma right now. Your mom is lost. Your mom woke up lost. I jumped in my car with Michelle, just rolled to Tacoma, going into my enemy's neighborhood. And these were the OLBs. They hate the shit out of me. So when I went into the house, I said, mom, she sat there lost. So mom is me. I told Michelle called a, called a um, hospital, um, ambulance right away, 911. My mom tried to reach for me. She's like, oh, no, no, no. I was like, no, you have to, you have to. So the ambulance came. A day later, I told Michelle, go with my mom. I'll be on my way. The ambulance drove off. And right when the ambulance left, I looked up, oh, man, I got no time for this. There was a bunch of enemies. What's up, blood? I said, what's up, blood? What's up? What the fuck you doing here? I just walked towards them, opened the door, just got in the car. They was like, oh, you're going to be like that? You ain't going to come out? Started my car. Oh, like Went on that. reverse, backed up. Fuck, I don't give a shit. I got to go get my mom. Went into the hospital. My mom was laying. Blood was everywhere. She's coughing. She blood was coming out of her nose. Michelle was over there wiping her, wiping all the bloods off her. I was sitting there trying to hold her hand, trying to talk to her, but she can't hear me. My dad came with her. My sister came, and she brought her. All of my relatives, my aunt and uncle, which I didn't want to see none of them at this time. My brother was in jail at that time. He don't know what's going on. But my mom been sick for the last, I don't know, like years. She's been sick, but we were so busy in life to pay attention to her. We weren't busy. We was just foolish. There's no such thing as busy. So the doctors said, put us in the room, said, sorry, your mom got 5% to live. My family looked at me. I mean, my sister looked at me, my dad looked at me. They said, do something, just talk to your mom, see if you can help her. I started talking to her, but all my relatives all came in the room. Just gives you no room to talk one-on-one, -on -one, cause everybody's interfering from you being emotional. You can't let people see you be a weakling. You have to be strong for your family's sake. The line went straight. The line went straight, and uh, they said, the doctors all said, sorry. 
I walked outside of the hospital. My dad followed me. He said, what are we going to do, son? He said, we're going to go across the street and buy some beer. I'm going to buy each of 40, drink with my dad. He just drank, drank. He looked at me in his sandals. He was wearing some sandals. All I could see was sad. What do we do now, son? What do we do now? Don't worry about it, Dad. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. It's, it's OK. We have no money. We're homeless. I didn't work. My brother's in jail. What are we going to do now? And this, my mom's blood is tied. My dad's family was trying to help, but they weren't. I'm not sure if they liked it, my mom. So I mean, I had to put together money. I had to sell everything I had to do a funeral. Michelle's been on my side the whole time. My dad was so lost after my mom's death. He just went blank. He just stood there crying, laying there crying. Dad went crazy. He don't know how to live without his wife. I had to sell some more stuff. I had to borrow a lot of people money. I promised to pay him back because I need to get my brother out of jail. There's one thing I didn't want him to miss out on. Me and Michelle went waiting for him to come out. We seen the doors unlocked. He was walking out of jail, and right when they opened the last door, he ran. I said, Tim. He turned around. He looks surprised. He's like, huh, what? What the fuck are you doing? Oh, I thought they accidentally let me out. I was <laughs> he was getting ready to break out. We got him a meal. Then he asked, why are you bailing me out for? I go, I got to tell you something. And uh, that time, you know, like I was mentioning, we was homeless, had nowhere to go. We had a friend named Little Chris in Tacoma. His electricity was out, like they didn't pay electricity. But that's the only place we had left to go to tell my brother to break off this news. And I bought some beer and I drank with my brother. I told him, hey, I didn't eat for four days. He's like, you didn't eat for four days? I said, I can't eat for four days. He drank a beer. He goes, why, why didn't you eat? I'm oh, sorry, mom just passed away. He looked down, he goes, did a lot of people go? I go, I held you on time because I didn't want you to miss out. And he was like, what should we do? And I like, got to do a lot of things. We're going to just try to make mom happy. In order to give a proper Buddhist funeral, one of her kids had to become a monk in order to do the blessings. So when the monks asked us, I stepped up and I got down on my knees and I put up my hand. I said, I'll do it. Then my brother comes up right after me. He's like, I can't watch you do it alone. We shaved our heads, shaved our eyebrows. We had to do like, oh my God, 10 hours of praying. We had to repeat the words and stay in a couple of days in the temple. And you had to live there. You eat like once a day and it's just noodles. We're from the street. People are already looking at me and my brother as gangster sons. Like, no, no, we're doing something good. We're praying for my mom. My mom's probably surprised, like, oh, my kids. The temple finally let me and my brother out to carry the casket to go do um, cremation. I couldn't do it. I couldn't push the button. I just stepped back. None of us could do it. That's the worst, it's horrible button ever for a child to do. I wonder her to live to the day to make her happy. She never seen happiness. The way she seen before she died, when she seen me and my little brother and my sister, we was gangster. We, me and my brother was doing bad. My brother was stealing cars, going to jail. Me, I was always in Seattle, and she did not know I was living on the street. She always wanted to watch me work, find my first job. And she used to always tell me growing up, like, one of these days, mom wants, is going to do a birthday party for you. Because she felt bad. But um, dude, she, she's a strong woman. She took my dad's bullshit to mine. So everything I do today is for her, definitely. And that's why when I dated Michelle since 1995, I love Michelle because there's a quote that says, if you could treat a lady like a princess, that means she was born in the arms of a queen. That's how my mom taught me how to treat people. SeaTac is late. Ever, 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 ever since I can remember, you were always there for us. Always. So, some people got heroes like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. My hero was you. <laughs> 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 my hero was you. <laughs> I look at you, older brother. But man, if you was older, you could be my dad. <laughs> I look up to you, nigga. I look up to you, lazy. <laughs> <laughs> over here, homie, over here. Other if you make make fun of your uh, older homie, they beat your ass. But, you know, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's all like it's all family, bro. You make a mistake, it's cool. We, we correct it. Yeah. We say what you did wrong, and we correct it. If it's worth checking you, we'll check you. If it's not, we're gonna tell you you're wrong, and that's it. 
You know, we give we give it, you a chance to fix it. You know what I mean? We don't What's we don't beat up people for no dumbass reason. That's right. We, we, we don't turn backs on each other. Yeah, we, we don't turn backs on each Would other. Would you beat bro? up your brother? Like your blood brother? I don't think so, man. You know what I'm saying? And you my would, brother. man. <laughs> my blood brother, but my not my rascal brother. You feel yeah. me? He left in '91. I want to say he came back in '92, and he left not '92, '93, and then uh, he left in '94. He came out for about a year. He was just sleeping at everybody's houses, running around, and we didn't actually have a spot to stay at. And then 1994. I was like doing time in the colony and then I heard he came back and he started hanging around with my little brother. And them two got close and uh, somehow lazies always get stranded on the street. Just him and my brother and they, they got nobody to run to so they do whatever for each other. Like sometimes they don't have nothing to eat. My brother just sneak inside the house and find food for him. They just stuck on the street for the whole summer. And then somehow he got back to Washington, found his way back. And then around November, the same year, like around 1994, I heard my brother got murdered by another Asian gang while I was locked up. And I know Lazy, he was hurt when he found out about it, the same as me. It hurt me so much that he took away my brother. That's how I'm lazy. Just keep in touch with me, with me, because he's really close to my brother. Until this day, we just consider consider each other as, as brother. We just show each other love. When I stopped dancing, it took me a while to even come back out. I only came around because there was a lot of shootings that was going on, and I lost a lot of friends. Looney was one of the main guys. I admire the way he ran things. A lot of people wanted him. He was the key to keeping us as a gatherer of TRG out there. Fourth of July, I got a call from Michelle saying that there was a drive-by. Got shot. He died. I flew in to be there for his funeral. And at the house, there was uh, two guys. Bo and Weasel, they was talking shit to everybody. Then Critter come walking up to me. He's like, lazy. Those fools right there might jump me. I go, don't worry about them. And he's like, you sure? I'm like, don't worry, man. And then another guy in Pokey came up to me. Hey, lazy, man, these guys are over here tripping, man. They're talking shit to everybody. They mean mugging me. Hey, don't worry about them. So when I said, don't worry, people came running, grabbed me, I'm like, hey, those fools are jumping somebody at Looney's funeral. You know, that's our homie. Bo and Weasel are jumping them. And those guys don't like Looney at the time. So they're jumping Critter. Yo, yo, man, chill. At the moment, they're just man, beating the shit out of them. The old man, folks that at the funeral were screaming like, oh, stop. I didn't choose to sit there and listen to a reason. I ran in there, pushed everybody off. I made a big scene. I'm like, get off, get off. And I picked up Critter. Those guys start swinging at me. My brother came in. He seen him swinging at his brother. So he came in right beside me. He's swinging back. We got in a big argument. So we decided to leave. And then they start giving me phone calls, giving me threats. Don't show my face around. It was official that Bo gave up on me in the South Side. Now he just got what he wanted. If it was power, it was to show fair. His OG was the guy that hit me. Now he's running the show. And he was the guy I jumped to TRG. He didn't want me to interfere or nothing, so he took. He took what he can. He get spread out my name bad. That gave me a bad name, and he told everybody, don't let Lazy walk up. They was making it against us to the point where it chased us, where it cleaned a lot of people out of the picture. It was like NWO for them, you know? And it was ugly. It was an ugly ride. Me and him, I was, we had beef ever since. Mind my own business, and I stayed away for a very long time. It's, it's a family. It's a family. It's I not just a gang, these man. motherfuckers any time of the day, no matter the night, the situation, homie, yeah. the one phone call away. And not even on some beef shit either, homie, on yep. some real family shit. Problems, whatever, dog. I can one phone call away, all right? How many <laughs> homies and you know that you done lived your whole life with? We didn't been through childhood with each other, homie. Yeah. All the way from the start of this shit. 
from when we, when we was out there doing what we do. We don't even young say bucks, shit. Yep. Just young bucks, too. Suffering, young suffering bro. Look, look at us now, bro. Yeah, we got history together, Look at us now, man. Too much history, we turn, history our, turn our backs to yeah, us, we, man. We did lose some people, but that's their fault. It was on them. It was on them. We ain't perfect. They made their own mistakes. The shit they did was... It went slide, man. So this is, this is our circle right now. We, we keep it tight. Vanna was now outcasted along with any others who opposed Bo. He went away and stayed with his girlfriend, Michelle. There's not one thing no more. Now there's like split. Now it's starting to be three, four different heads to turn into three, four different sides. And But there was one that was standing on top, which was him, Bo. They was running the show now. And everybody that they didn't think fit in their category or from their block, wasn't welcome. He's, 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 he's a good, he's a good OG. He taught us the right way. Yep. You know what I'm saying? We, we got rules. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we ain't wild like that. But we know where they stay, our lane. You know what I'm saying? We separate ourselves from each other. You know what I'm saying? We crack off. You know what I'm saying? We, you know what I'm saying? Black, black. No, you know, click life, but, but bro, though. That's how, hey, you know, hey, that's how TRG stay alive, man. That's how we stay alive, man. Trouble, yeah. yeah. trouble comes to us, man. Trouble comes to us. Lazy would rather, lazy would rather tell you to live up to your dreams and ambitions than tell you go ride or any day. You know it's what I mean? Not, it's not about violence. Yeah, it's not about violence. The crazy thing after all these years of me staying away, and one day I ran into another TRG that was going through the same situation where he was by himself and he wanted to connect. We connect. And it started again. He had a little brother that brought in all his little friends from middle school. And I told him, don't do it. It's don't do it, man. There's too much problems. And he kept getting in these little kids in the hood. I told him, if things go wrong, how are we gonna? I'm not ready to handle this situation again. But he kept doing it. And then when it got deep, he wouldn't be able to handle it. So I took it in and started talking to these kids. And I started because I seen so many things that weren't right. This is gonna be a generation that's about to fall through. That's some shit that they weren't expecting. Now I can't leave. Now I've just been a part of, being a part of these kids that's joining, and I can't walk away. So I didn't want what ha was happening to me to happen to these kids. So I always stuck, in, stuck involved, encouraging them to finish school. I've been there for them. When they finished school, I went to their graduation, and I gave them money. I did school projects for them, helped them, and they were getting deeper. They came to me for advices over and over, stories, advices, and they kept getting more friends in. The enemies found out bowling and they found out. They, they targeted me that here I go building something, uh, an army most likely. It was ne never meant to be two sides. And so homies kept coming, kicking my house. We just hung out mind our own business. And we got more deep and the name is just blowing up out there. A lot of little homies are now growing to be so down and dedicated loyalty for the older homies. He pulled one giant big mistake it caused it a problem by starting shit this shit went far out of hand i got asked to stay out of it or stand right beside i said uh, I, I got, i'm gonna stay right beside him there was now four gangs that click up that's coming towards me my house was the first to get shot up and this was when my wife, she was seven months pregnant. For the last 10 years, I've been fighting those guys. Been most, instead of playing offense, I was doing more defending myself. This time was coming at me. all out, but the problem stopped when it was the last fight. My homie's little brother versus another, um, one of the big guys from the other side, little brother, they went one-on-one. -on -one. And nobody jumped in, they said fight one-on-one. -on -one. And then the Kenyans came around and they said, just call it off, no more of this. After so many fights from the younger guys from another side and the younger guys that was down from my side. You know, I was thankful that it's finally, everything's going to rest. It's an ugly world out there. Your best friend turned you to your enemies. You guys heard rap songs that said that. It's a true story. Your best friend do turn it to your enemies. But if we are under one rule, under one strength, that we do not turn on each other's back. By sticking to that rule, 
and work together for the rest of our lives. We don't we could be TRGs for the rest of our lives, but I rather appreciate to see you guys making it. I've been through the stage where people call call me like, lady, we need a place to stay. Lazy, we need things. And by watching their back, they turn their backs on me. I've been through this shit over and over. When you guys do good, you guys are gonna appreciate me one day. You're gonna be like, damn, one of our OGs from TRG told us to do better. Congratulate me when I graduated from high school and I'm doing good and I'm getting paid real good. You know why? Because I wasn't used to go shoot somebody. Because I wasn't used. I think the best solution is when somebody need to go ride, it's from your heart. You don't get forced. Because the person that get forced out there to go in the street to go do drive-bys, when it's time they get caught, they snitch. But when a person get hurt, when somebody hurt any, any one of you guys, you guys go out there with your heart. And when you get caught up, you're like, I don't give a fuck because that motherfucker hurt my brother. That's why we stick so close into this category in Rascal Love. And that's what Rascal Love means to me because I stand up for everybody claiming TRG against the motherfuckers that stabbing against me, putting a knife against my back and doing everything can because I so much believe in this group that stands right here. When I was working at a job at a warehouse, there was a guy that called me an Asian dog eater. He was looking for his screwdriver. He was walking around yelling at everybody. Where the fuck's my screwdriver? And I had a screwdriver where I was working with a bunch of screws. He came up to me, is this my screwdriver? I said, no, nah, it's mine. Then he was like, it is mine. And I was like, it ain't yours. Then I grabbed it out of his hand. Then he said, you stupid Asian dog eater. And I started talking shit, fuck you, bitch. And he threw all my tools and everything off my, off my workstation. And I got up and I ran to his workstation. I grabbed all his screws. I threw it across the whole warehouse. And then I started laughing. He was like, oh, you think you hard? Then I went back to work. And each night I heard he was wearing a bubble jacket because it's cold inside the warehouse. I heard a, a bubble jacket went whoosh, And I looked to the side and I seen a fist coming directly towards my face, very slow, but. <laughs> and I was already on the floor. All I did was duck like this. He swung so hard that he tripped over me, flew over there. I took the advantage and I jumped on him and I started giving him blows, blows. People came and stopped us, coworkers. They held me back, people held him back. And then we looked at each other's face, he turned around. He screamed, Richard, that's my supervisor. Both Vanna and his coworker were fired. He was now unemployed and had to search for a new job. There's a saying that maybe it's a blessing in disguise. Ever since he was a kid, he had always liked video cameras. Now that he was sitting at home unemployed, it gave him the opportunity to explore his interest. I used to walk around my house when I had a shirt that says Tiny Rascal Gang Pomona. I recorded that. And then I went and recorded like some drawings that I did of gangs. Then I recorded myself throwing the gang sign. I seen this ad. They was looking for a production assistant. Gave him a phone call. They said, do you have any experience? I said, no, if I could do some free work to learn off you guys, just watch and learn. So went in for an interview. He came in, he's like the last guy of the day. And um, he had no experience. He had no equipment. He um, had no education. My first impression was, uh, Dude, this is not a warehouse, it's an office work. Had a vintage production sign. I seen cameras, I seen how a green screen studio looked like. And I was asking so much questions. That's what sparked in my interest. And then he said that he wanted to learn. And he, he, he just like impressed me so much that uh, this guy had more heart and determination that it's just, uh, it's just, I gotta give this guy a shot. RJ, the owner of the company, gave me the green light that I'm in. Come in three days a week. I scanned photos, capturing log on Final Cut Pro, so, and I was getting paid. You know, Van was real open about it. He didn't ever hide it, hide who he was. He's always been authentic with me. I told my wife, I go, I got, I brought in somebody that's, that's actually a gang member. Part of me felt scared a little bit about it because I have kids. I was worried about maybe somebody's going to break in and steal all my stuff. You know, and I had those thoughts that passed through my mind, but I go, it's just it got to go with the flow and see what happens. The side work is going out with RJ, work with him, seeing how he used the camera, coming back with his DV tape to the office and seeing how they edit videos. They told me, if you want to learn, get yourself a, a Mac. So I went and got a iBook G4. Vanna was always like the first one to volunteer. If we needed anybody for a crew to go do a shoot, he was thirsty uh, to learn. He would, I would give him scanning projects, thousands of them, and he never ever complained once. I learned and I took learning onto my own by reading books. 
going to Google, YouTube, learning everything on site. So I started practicing, doing my own work, and I went and bought my first camera. And I started taking the camera and just started shooting videos, coming home, editing, and I started trying to do freelance work. So that became my newest passion. Now, even though Vanna was learning a lot from working part-time gigs with RJ, it was not enough money to support his family. He soon had to get a full-time job with Genie Industries, but still kept his weekends open to do video work. And so he progressed this way until he received an interesting email. And I got an email from RJ. It was a forward. It came from Beyond Cinema saying that if I knew any gangsters in Southern California, because they was creating a movie about, based on uh, Southern California Asian gangsters. And I spread the word. But just like a lot of people didn't take me seriously. When No Gangster stepped forward, Vanna volunteered himself to audition for the part. He said that if chosen, he would pay his own airfare. That sounded fine to me, so I asked him to send in an audition tape. Hi, my name is Vanna Foote, and I am doing an audition for the role of Rocky. You reading this? Fuck no, it's for school. Just gotta copy some quotes out of that shit. You should take the time to read this. And when the fuck was the last time you read? I read all the time. You just don't see me. Sure, baby. You get those books over at the library over at Holland's back? Yeah. Shit, that place was the spot back in the days. I remember back in the days when I used to be in school, there used to be all sorts of shit that went down. Drama Central. I remember when the fops used to rumble and shit back there and where they used to hide all Although Vanna's audition wasn't the Oscar performance shit. I was looking for, I liked Little his enthusiasm. To the tree, you know, I decided whatever. to offer him a smaller role instead and invited him to San Diego. Crazy part is, got the email back saying, fly to San Diego. And so, San Diego, here I came. Hop on the plane the whole time, couldn't quit thinking. I was telling my OG, my OG Goofy, I called him in Pomona. I was telling him the news, like, hey, I got in a movie. I'm going to be doing a movie. I showed him the spec trailer. He's like, you sure you want to go? San Diego don't have much homies. I mean, there's a lot of enemies out there. And when you watch the video, he's like, man, those look like a bunch of enemies. That was very scary. So but I took chances. The experience of making Bang Bang was just so far from any other production that I had been involved with. We all stayed at Byron's house. It was like the real world type shit. We were just forced to just to bond and to live with each other for the entire amount of time that it took to shoot the film. It just created this, you know, this era of like family. Byron said the production crew would be here in the morning. They came carrying a bunch of bags. I'm like, oh man, this is crazy. We've seen the red camera, like this camera is crazy. We've seen the lights, We've seen people holding things. I'm like, what is that? Hey, we're doing a, a, a take one, man. Charlie versus Jock. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> man, you put me on my side. Oh, I know, true. Look at this. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> 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 we went out and ate together, morning, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And on our days off, we went out there and kick it at the beach, just hung out. So chemistry was, was built. Most of the time we were just drunk, dude. Yeah, it was damn near like a frat house too. Everybody was just drinking, smoking after the set, just whatever, man, whatever goes down, goes down. <laughs> the director's a motherfucker. <laughs> he made the lead actor fucking sleep on the floor. <laughs> What's up? We at Mission Beach and SD, feeling good. You know, day off, been working hard all week. Got bullet right here. And Wang, Wangster. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to ride the roller coaster. Six tickets. Six dollars. Hey, hey, when we get on top, get, get a view of the ocean, all right? Oh, all right, I'll try my best. <laughs> oh, man. I'll try my Where? best. Oh, I'll try my fucking best. I'll try my fucking best. <laughs> oh shit, okay, this is gonna be the top. Oh, oh, dude. Fuck you, Oh, damn, dude. Oh, damn, dude. <laughs> Oh, 
One year later, Bang Bang finally made its premiere at the 2011 Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. Vanna, 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 Walter, get the last picture real quick. Hi. Hurry up, David. Bring your ass over here. Hey, further back. Come on, get this picture, dog. Come on, David. Please. <laughs> you know how many people are going to be there? Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. That imagine if they could just sit down and watch yourself on a base screen. Be, seeing yourself was a dream come true. The great feeling in the world is meeting your cast and crew again and just enjoying our accomplishment together. It made me feel I became a somebody again. If once, if the streets finally dragged me down, it made me feel like I was supposed to be a loser or if I didn't find my way out, then I'm, if I died or if I end up in prison, you could blame anything when life goes wrong. But when you take chances, and now you see yourself in a movie, you, if the haters don't want to give you a congratulation, you pat yourself on the back. My homies, they look at it as that, man, Lazy Support is graduating high school, and he dropped out of school. How the hell did he pull all this off? I'm trying. But I'm saying, who cares what was expected from us, what the world wanted to see us? We went to the awards gala, seeing Byron walk up there accepting his uh, first award for his film. It was even crazier just sitting there. And that was the start of a film festival run. And knowing later down the line that there was more to come. In October 2011, Bang Bang made its hometown premiere at the San Diego Asian Film Festival. It, it, it reached more of a dream now that there's BMWs giving you rides. We're staying at a hotel. We was drinking, we was partying. I think it has a lot of heart. I think it, it's truly, it comes from a real place. And you can feel that. What was my impression of them? They look a lot like the characters in the movie. <laughs> the memorable part is we was already known as the bad boys of the film festival in San Diego. Each and every one of us we was in the hallways drinking. We had a lot of drinks. We was taking beers back to the hotel. People seeing us waking up in the morning still drinking a beer. With all the excitement at the festival, it was now time for the screening. During the Q&A, a question about who the intended audience was for the film sparked a passionate response from Vanna. We've seen movies like Colors, uh, Minister Society, Boys in the Hood, and with a big Asian film community, we done forgot about that the culture of Asians being in gangs does exist. And we swept underneath the rug for so long. So when this film, Bang Bang, came out, told us a story that it, it is here. And the message here is whatever your passion is, whatever your goal is, like Ty, for example, in the movie, that whatever we have a goal of we're trying to reach, we could change at any time, any moment, and we can make it anywhere. As long as we pursue one road, one path, no matter what goes on behind us, we move forward and we could be anything we want. So this film showed that if Ty can make it, and it's a true story, he is out there and he's doing very positive moves. Right now he's in Minnesota talking to kids in high school about real stories that gangbanging does uh, exist. He's telling the kids now, he's being real about it. Uh, you don't expect anybody to change, but it all starts by an example and motivations, hopefully music, it could be anything, or being here um, in front of everybody here for me is a big passion. I came from Seattle and never been on a film before, and I had a passion for creating films, and this is my first time being, a, being an actor, so it's quite an experience, and it's definitely changed my life, and I came from the same shoes as a lot of people that was involved with gangs, and I'm proud to be here, and I'm definitely taking a path where I can show my friends and everybody that looks at me today, and that I can look at, and hopefully we could all change together, so I'm proud that Bang Bang is here today. Uh, woo. Woo. If I could go back to all this experience, I would actually go back to making Bang Bang again. That's what started everything 
went to a dream come true, but being able to work on the set of Bang Bang with everybody hanging out with my group was the best experience of my life. After Bang Bang, Vanna's life went back to the routine, working 12-hour shifts at Genie and spending some weekends to shoot videos with RJ. That's where all the homies were working, so we were doing warehouse work. It's 10-hour shifts, but it always goes on to 11, 12 hours every day. Work is dangerous. The people is good. The co-worker is great. The, the job there is frustrating. I, mean, I like the 10 hours a day. I didn't like 30 minutes of lunch with hundreds of people fighting for six microwave. One day at work, something strange happened. I went to go put some screws. My co-worker go talk to me, and I look at them. And I just felt my head, and they go, and I couldn't hear them. Then I just told them, I just tried to speak it out, but I can't hear myself. I was like, hey, I can't hear you guys. I went back to work. My lead came up, are you okay? Do you want to go outside? And I heard him, I'm like, no, that's okay. And I told my um, homies that I got working with me. At lunch, I'm like, man, something's going on. The guys I ride home with said that I was speaking random stuff where I was just saying something to them, but sp spoke a different language. Got home, told my wife, oh, something's going on, I'm gonna go to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night, still happening. It woke me up, so I went to the hospital. They put like five things on my heart and like 20 things on my head. They discovered that uh, it was coming back that I got a brain tumor. The MRI shows that Vanna has a tumor in his left temporal area. Uh, and in order to figure out what it is and to determine whether or not he needs further treatment, we need to do a biopsy. When I found out when I got that news, I wanted to run away from it. I just jumped out the car and took a jog into the middle of nowhere. Just jog to like a forest, dark roads, just to find an inspiration to be fearless bleeding in the brain or damage to an artery that could cause a stroke, uh, which could potentially uh, cause damage to speech function or understanding of language, uh, like you said, memory. So all of those are risks that are involved and it could potentially be disabling or, or life-threatening. Truth is, we need each other. Because without each other, we end up alone. I'm, I'm, I'm getting very sick now. You guys know, I got, I got to the point where I lost my job. I went to medical, medical leave to the point where I got laid off and I can't get an unemployment because I'm not allowed to seek work. So now I'm getting more broker than ever. People that don't know me want to say that I was born in a better family. That's why I'm there where I was at. It's struggle, I strive, I grind. I did everything I can to get where I belong and where I want to be. I never gave up in where I should be. And well, the other sides betrayed me. And that's why I brought the game to you guys, so you guys won't be treated the same way. The first time when Baby got in, I tried to talk to Baby. You sure this is what you want? I even gave Baby that talk. I'm like, you sure you want to join the hood? Because this is how many people that's going to treat us wrong, right? I told you that in the beginning. Everything. When Sneaky was looking for stuff, I, he found me on Craigslist trying to sell my alarm. I found out that was Sneaky. His, ad, his email address is so full. It's just EBK7126. I'm like, that's Sneaky. I played with him, pretending to be this big, Girl, I was just wanting to <laughs> fuck them up, okay? And then when we met little Joey, little man, I showed him a lot of love. When we met Jason, we showed a lot of love because we wanted to stick together as a family. When little Joey, even Loco, when Loco first met me, he, he had a little problem with his hand. He came to me like, lazy man, I got a little problem in my hand. How can we fix this? And I stood right beside him. And there's a lot of people in the hood today that will stand against you instead of with you. They won't listen to your story. They'll listen to who's deeper. And that's how we go against each other. That's the start. This is the third term. The snakes get rushed out of our group, out of the shadows, because we don't need them no more. If I never stand up for you, then you have a right to never stand up for me. But if you know me very well, I will never go against you. I will appreciate you, and I will support you for everything you do. I have the bad movements in life. I'm going through a bad stage. I'm not supposed to be thinking about stress, but we have some snakes here in town. But we still got the same sheriff. So ain't nothing going down in SeaTac, right? Am I right? So we're gonna stay the same. One love, rascal love. Rascal. Coming from the childhood of like these gang wars, you lose, lost so many homies. You think you finally got away with any dangers to your life? Like I ran into gangsters. I've been jumped, been shot at, been stabbed. Now I'm facing something that it's just like walking into a, a gun. This is, you're facing a bullet now. I survived all these days. Now I'm facing something that's gonna give me an opportunity. How how close it is to fearing for your life. I reached my goals if anything was to go down, but if not, I want to come out a champion and pursue everything to be a better 
person because I still got to make it out here to take care of my daughter and my wife and my little homies. I survived this long. I'm not, I'm not to worry uh, at all. I'm ready. Vanna wanted this documentary made so that his memories and legacy could be preserved if he did not come out of the operation the same. Currently, Vanna has made a full recovery, but with a daughter to raise, staggering medical bills, and no job, he still has many challenges ahead. By watching this film and learning about his story, you have helped him achieve his dreams.